Uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to um, bring over to this side of the pond uh, Martin Reinhardt, uh, who um, I met several years ago in a different photography conference that was organized by Friedrich, who's just come in, Friedrich Tietzen. Um, and um, he is really an incredible thinker and uh, invented the TX transformer, he told me not to mention, but I had to. Um, and um, and is in fact um, uh, kind of a wild uh, engineer and and inventor and whatnot. Anyway, um, but he told me to tell you that you were what were you just an engineer with a memory problem? Yeah, he's just an engineer with a memory problem. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Okay, all welcome. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much to be still here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a long day, come on. Um, I'm not m much of a theorist, so I kind of will just share my favorite movies with you. Um, I'm a complete film buff, I love movies. And um, as you might read in my little um, text I, I, I put in the, um, uh, you know, in this little thing here, um, I, I lost my memory in 2005, and it was quite um, a weird experience, because if you forget everything, um, you find out that you are nothing. So um, from this day on, or let's say from, it took like one year to recover and to get most of this memory back, um, I somehow had a different feeling about photography as, um, uh, a source which might be constitutional for yourself, because if you don't have the, mim the images in your mind, uh, you are happy about everything you could find externally. <laughs> because it's kind of a proof that you've been there. And what I try to do tonight is um, to talk about the different kinds of how photography and memory can interact or what one can mean for the other, or the other way around. And um, there's certainly this kind of set of the head, where the camera is, is the eye, and pictures are taken and put into an archive, so that you can go there later and look at them. And I have uh, compiled quite a lot of um, excerpts from movies, um, talking about this kind of uh, technological fantasy or utopia. And with every utopia, technological or media ut uh, utopia, it's always the same thing. There's two extremes. One extreme is uh, the fear of the absolute media or the fear of absolute control, loss of control. And that's what we will see in these movies. But um, before I start with this, I want to show you something, and I, <clears throat> I'm really astonished that I'm the first person today who does this. I haven't seen any baby photos, so uh, <laughs> uh, I show you, and I will share with you a very special moment in the life of my daughter. And I had the, the luck to capture the very first moment she saw herself on an iPhone. So she saw her own image. And it's very interesting what's happening. I won't tell you, you see yourself, and it's incredible. And it, I don't say this because I'm the proud father, but it's because it's really a very special moment. And kind of to connect this to my topic, um, she won't remember this moment. She was too young, she was two and a half. But still, she will have the record of the moment. And I will come to this point later, at a certain point in my life, where I will talk about a very similar um, thing that happened to me. So let's see uh, Maya at the age of um, two and a half, seeing her first, first time herself. Wait. So what she's doing is she, um, <laughs> she's looking at me.
And now that I come into the picture, <laughs> she starts to scream because it's someone else who proves that the image is not just an illusion. And now the most incredible thing happens. She takes an object to validate that the image is really the image. She puts something in between herself and the camera because she can look at the object and the camera can look at the object and she can look at the camera that looks at the object. So she really found a way to, to make it objective. And Yeah, that's basically it. Um, well, a good reason to buy a camera is if you have a kid. I mean, this is normal. And um, there's billions of photos of kids. And there's um, a short um, introduction of the movie, um, one hour photo. Um, uh, it's kind of, I will talk more about this movie in a second. I just show this introductional um, scene. Wait a minute. Family photos depict smiling faces. Births, weddings, holidays, children's birthday parties. People take pictures of the happy moments in their lives. Someone looking through our photo album would conclude that we have led a joyous, leisurely existence. Free of tragedy. No one ever takes a photograph of something they want to forget. Well, maybe not. Um, i show you something else. It's... Um uh, a Swedish company which applied for a Kickstarter project and they have Sometimes another concept. the best moments in life are the simple ones. The things that pass us by without us even noticing. The small surprises and the everyday experiences. At Momoto, we love the simple moments but we hate forgetting them. So we started thinking, what if we could capture those moments and create a true photographic memory? What if we could build a camera small enough to never be in the way and smart enough to capture life as we lived? This is what we ended up with, the Momoto Life Logging Camera. It's small, light, weather protected, and takes beautiful 5 megapixel pictures. Just clip it on and it starts taking pictures. Put it down or place it in your pocket and it stops. It's that easy. And all the pictures are safely stored on Momoto's storage service. 
We know what you're thinking. Two photos a minute is a whole lot of photos, right? Well, to make things as easy as possible, we developed apps for both iPhone and Android that automatically organize your photos on a timeline. Want to remember the name of the restaurant last night? Easy. Thanks to Momoto's smart algorithm, GPS, and time data, you can just search, find, and share. We're really passionate about getting this product out into the world. We've been working for a year to develop the camera and apps, and we have a great team on the job. But we need funding to start production of the first thousand cameras. And that's where we need help from the Kickstarter community. With your support, we're ready to make this happen. Yeah, let's see if this is such a good idea. Um, we, we are now coming to the creepy part of this evening. <laughs> um, I talked about this movie, One Hour Photo. I mean, it's not a masterpiece, but still, it's, it's about um, Robin Williams, who works at the One Hour Photo um, uh, service, and he kind of gets obsessed with one of his customers. And, uh, well, it's not turning out to be a good story. Let's, and wait, this is just... Um, <laughs> the film buffs might recognize the music. It's Cape Fear. So the question is clear, what is happening when someone sneaks inside your memories? What is when you, someone kind of hacks your life, life stream? It's a one very unpleasant uh, kind of idea and I will take it a little further. <laughs> So this is getting uncanny and an even um, more unpleasant idea is this one. Yeah, what's wrong? Sorry.
Okay. Bad joke. I made a bad joke. You're not a replicant. Go home. Okay? No, real. I'm sorry. Go home. So the ultimate horror is not someone sneaking into your memories, but finding out that your own memories are not your memories. <laughs> and the only proof you have is a bloody photograph. And that's what we see. And there's an interesting thing which I just discovered when I captured this scene. The photo moves in the end. Just <laughs> you see, Deckard is now looking at the picture. I assume that everyone knows the story. It's, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Having pictures of yourself might be substantial, might be something that ensures you with your being yourself. And that's an experience that I had very much so. <laughs> because um, I think sometimes we just remember pictures of events and not the actual event. So the photograph of the event comes in between the actual event and our memory. And here's a, certain, a second scene I, I want to show from Blade Runner. <clears throat> First, because I like it, and secondly, because it. What's that? Jesus Christ, what have I done? It's a very famous scene where Deckard goes into the picture, and um, I show it because I will show the completely different image set in the next film. In this future he's living in, you can go into images and see all the details and you can re get really go, yeah, that would be wonderful, yeah. Yeah, super, yeah, it's much better. Oh, wait a second, I made a mistake, sorry. Because this, is the reason I, so it's not only our memory that contains secrets we want to keep from other people, but even the pictures we keep might be something like evidence. And they might help to reconstruct past events. Mm -hmm. Stop. Oh,
back. Wait a minute. Go right. Stop. Your hand's 57.19. Track 45 left. Stop. Your hand's 15 to 23. So this scene, Deckard is sneaking into another person's pictures, another person's me. memory. But in the next um, film, which is also a classic, um, the situation is a little bit different. This is from Glow Up by Michelangelo Antonioni. And you might know the story. It's about a, f a photographer who has an encounter in the park. And he takes random pictures. And he starts to get obsessed with this picture set he did. He sees a couple fooling around on the green grass. And in his darkroom, he starts to um, notice that something is wrong. So he, he, he fantasizes about other people being there. And here in this scene, he magnified one detail of a picture to an extent that it doesn't show anything. But um, in his fantasy, and that's what's just happening here, he say, thinks, in a combination with the other pictures, he thinks that it's a dead body. And the weird thing is that he actually was there, but he didn't see it himself. It's not his own memory, but still, oh, what's happening here? But still, it's in the record he made. And the weird twist in the Antonioni movie is that he's actually right. So he goes to the park and he finds, finds a dead body, but the problem is when he comes back, all his pictures are gone someone has taken them, and the only picture that stays with him is this one, which proves absolutely nothing, because you can't see it. So that's a problem. You know it, you've seen it, you've seen the dead body, but you didn't take a picture. So how could you possibly convince someone else? And there's a scene I don't show now because we're a little late, where he shows it to his girlfriend, and she says, says, it just looks like one of those pictures in the galleries. <laughs> For him, it means the world because he, he was there. It's connected to his memory. But for her, not knowing, it's nothing. So um, you can't show your memories to someone else, can you? And if you, if you could, would you do it? So um, I'm coming back to those intruders into our memory. And um, there's another not so good movie, but still, again, with Robin Williams. It's called The Final Cut. And it's about someone who is um, extracting memories from dead people. They have a chip in their brain. and. Um, He's the one who gets the chip and makes a best of video from, this, from these memories. And so he browses through, um, through other people's memories. And then they, they have some kind of a presentation at the funeral. And he's absolutely specialized on editing these memories, so filtering them. And here we see something which might remember you what we saw earlier in this uh, clip for the Swedish camera. So the whole life is put into a live stream. And it's him who makes the decision what is significant and which information you should better hide.
and the company producing these chips is called Eyes. And the twist in the movie is that he, um, he finds out that the guy committed a terrible crime and then he's killed. But what he didn't know is that he also had a chip in his head and with his chip he recorded what he saw on these tapes which were um, uh, deleted later. So the movie is actually not very good, you don't have to see it. And the end of this scene will show you why. But you get the idea. And that's my advice to every filmmaker, don't do anything like this, ever. <laughs> okay, you got the idea. So, now, what, what is if the human camera is broken? So if the recording device, in this time, yourself, is psychotic, what's the outcome if the camera doesn't work? And there's a very nice film by David Trumbull, Brain, Project Brainstorm, or Brainstorm it was called in, in English. And um, it's basically about a device that allows you to record uh, your memories and other people can see them, they just, they're into it, they can feel it. And now the main character somehow finds out that the, the, the system was misused for military purposes. And they even, in the movie, that's really an interesting point, in the movie they, someone dies while her, um, like, her being, her consciousness is recorded. And the question in the movie is, can you watch another person's death without dying yourself? Hey, whatever you want. And there's now a very surprising, uh, nice thing I want to show you. So he's going to enter these um, uh, restricted files. He hacks the main computer and they let, to do him, let him do that. So the first thing he sees is a disclaimer. In a few moments, you will have an experience which will seem completely real. It will be the result of your subconscious fears transformed to your conscious awareness. Warning, this tape must not be played by government personnel. It can be extremely harmful and result in severe trauma. You have five seconds to terminate this tape. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I leave it to you. <laughs> Good. Um, <clears throat> well, now we have learned a lot about um, this kind of um, 
scenarios. So memory is something which is not stable, something which can be hacked. Some other people can go into your memory or you even are not sure that it's your memory. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a story, and it's a nice story, don't be afraid, about my, <laughs> my life and a little project I want to do. Um, the whole story starts here. Um, uh, wait a sec. Okay, that's me. Wait. And for a very, a series of very strange events in my life, uh, I was separated from my mother when I was one and came back to her when I was four. four and in at the time between one and three, uh, kind of a no-go area in my brain. And that's actually a picture from the time I can't remember anything. So I, I see the boy, I, I know that's me, but I have no memory of that. Okay, that's normal. We have, we have certain things we can't remember. That's, but the weird thing starts here. This is um, my first like severe, oh, not serious girlfriend. <laughs> <They're> not severe. <laughs> and, um, and for me, it was completely okay that I had a, a very specific taste for specific looking girls. But one day, my stepfather said something very troubling. He said, um, Jesus Christ, all your girls, they just look like your maid. And I said, did I have a maid? I didn't know that. So uh, somewhat taking care of me. And he said, yes, he, she looked exactly like this girl you're just with. And um, I have no memory of her. My cousins who, who, who knew her, they, they were two years old, and they kind of said, yes, she, she looked this and this way. And um, so what happened is that at a very early, I, I started to sing, and uh, I found out at a very early age I was in love with Marie Mathieu, who had the same haircut. And um, you might know this from the 70s, UFO. And um, I also had some feelings for him. <laughs> and them. <laughs> and, um, and then um, I'm a specialist in movies of the 20s. Um, and that's because I fell in love with Louis Brooks. And, um, I love the film of the 60s, and this is for Anna Karenina and Brigitte Bardot, and of course, Pulp Fiction. So um, what I want to say is I, I had an inner image, but it wasn't an image. I had a, something in my memory reminded me of something which must have been a good experience, someone who cares about you, someone who's there for you in a situation which is not easy. and. Um, the project I, I do is I want to make a photo fit of the person, of this maid. I just, I have a huge collection of about 500 pictures of girls who might look like her. And I try to make a photo fit and then I want to make the attempt to find this maid again and to match it with the picture. So the experiment is I don't have a picture of her, I don't have a picture in my mind, but there's something else which makes me recognize her in other people. So um, that's my very own <laughs> mind experience, if you, um, yeah. Let's see, I'll inform you about the outcome. Um, and I just told you this weird story because it's, um, my experience is that that memory um, functions so much different than what the movies show. And it's something to, kind of to, to go on in this journey, to, or this quest to find out how, how memory really works. Okay, for, um, because we, it's getting late, um, I skip some of the things I wanted to show and just go to um, a movie I really very much like because it discusses um, the aspect of memory and photography in a very kind of light-footed way. It's a film by Agnes Vada called Ulysses. 
And um, the whole film is about this picture. It's a man and a boy and a dead goat on a beach, on a pebble beach. And the weird thing is the following. She goes to the man and the boy and shows them their picture. And I show you the reaction of the two. <clears throat> So this is the man. Wait a second. It's years later. So the picture was taken 58. So her quest goes on and she goes to the boy and asks him if he remembers the picture. And it's even odder than this one. So to come to an end now, um, I show you Agnes Wader's um, conclusion on the topic, and I think it's very cheerful, and I hope this is uh, how my uh, lecture will end, and you, you go out here without um, being frightened by the other films. So um, what she says is that the picture is just a picture. <laughs> Et dans son époque, comme on le disait de le faire à l'école, 
Mais les anecdotes, les interprétations, les histoires, rien n'apparaît dans cette image. J'aurais pu la faire dimanche dernier, ou hier, moi ou quelqu'un d'autre. L'image est là, c'est tout. Une image, on y voit ce qu'on veut. Une image, c'est ça et le reste. L'autre jour, j'y voyais les clichés d'une enfance tiraillée. Tiraillée entre l'image du père, le futur, de vous. Et l'image de la mère au gros ventre chaud, couché. L'enfant, que pense-t-il J'aime qu'il soit celui de Los Olvidados, qu'il soit le petit prince, pauvre Blaise, Oliver Twist et tous les autres enfants tristes, légendaires. Un autre jour, j'ai vu dans cette image l'énigme du sphinx, résolu en trois visions, les trois âges de la vie. Mythologie, vous me faites rêver, mais le héros absolu c'est Ulysse. Et dans cette image où je m'obstine à voir la Méditerranée, Ulysse, c'est celui qui rêve sur le rivage, celui qui n'en finit pas de retourner à sa femme chèvre, la belle Pénélope. Ulysse, renaissant à chaque escale, et une femme à chaque île. Nausicaa qui le découvre nu parmi les roseaux, et Calypso qui le séduit, et Circé qui l'envoûte. Mais lui, le coquin, le malin, le bavard, Ulysse aux mille ruses, qui sauve ses marins en les faisant sortir de l'antre du cyclope, caché sous la toison des béliers et des chèvres, attaché par trois. Ulysse s'en va toujours, oubliant, là, des demi-déesses presque immortelles et des Ulysse Junior. Des petits Ulysse qui grandissent pendant que chantent les sirènes, les sirènes de la mémoire. So may the sirens of memory sing for you tonight. Thank you. Bye bye. I, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Still don't have enough. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, no, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm interested in that. At one point, you, you made the claim that you don't feel that memory works the way that yes, our media technologies tell, tell absolutely, us that, that yeah. it does. Uh, I just wanted to know what, what you, how you think it works. I mean, I, I couldn't help by watching all of your examples yeah. feeling like. I can't think of memory in any other way but how they're okay. telling me that, you know, and, you know, like Frazier Kittler says, uh, the ancients used tabula rasa because of the predominance of writing. There's mm. a certain moment where people start saying they see their lives flash before their eyes because of the predominance of film, mm -hmm. you know, so. Well, I can take, tell you very um, specifically how it works, or at least how it comes back. <laughs> um, well, a, so my thing was, I, I woke up one morning and I, I, it was like um, everything was um, vibrating very fast. So I, I couldn't read and I couldn't track an idea for more than two seconds. So basically my brain was reset every two seconds. And this, this leads to um, a state of you just hear at the moment that you can't think further and you can't think back. And um, this is actually very frightening. But the good thing is you forget about your fear because you forget about everything. So if you're afraid, you're not. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. And, um, and then after a while, um, I was very enthusiastic that after some weeks, memories came back. So I recognized a person I knew because otherwise you stand there and you look at Johnny and think, OK, well, wow, who's that? <laughs> no idea. And um, so memories come back, and they come back in clusters. It's not like one thing comes back, but a, a very detail comes back, and it's connected to three or four other details. And it doesn't make any sense. There's no connection between the events. And then um, more and more memories came back, um, and then the enthusiastic state of mind is gone. Because then comes the freaky part. Because you know that there is something, but you can't touch it. You know there must have been 
something, but you don't know it. And you know the person, but you don't know who he is, where you met him, in which relation you stand to him. And that's really freaking you out, because everyone could be everything, but you, can, you, have not, you do not have the key. And um, so what, what, what I understood is that, um, that memories are connected to different places in your brain and connected to, to other memories, which are not kind of logically connected. Uh, kind of generate an, an, a network with your, within your brain that gets closer and tighter. And the, the gaps within your memory, they somehow become, at a certain point, a question of plausibility. So if this happened and that happened, and this person was there, then it's very plausible that the other person also was there. So you don't really remember, but you can in interpolate from three or four kinds of memories that this must have been there. And that's actually the way our consciousness works. We don't see everything. If I go on the street, I don't, I don't recognize every car, and I don't know if you were there or if there was a tree. I know there was a tree, but I don't know which kind of tree. So, <clears throat> and this is really a problem, for example, with um, eyewitnesses. This is a certain, they have a certain feeling for a certain situation, and, it's, and if, if they are asked in a certain way, their brains say it's, there's, a plausibility, it's, uh, uh, there's a certain chance that it was this way, but I can't prove it. And the, of, the more often they, they think about the situation, the more they believe in their own memory. And it's, I, I, I think it's a standard in, in kind of memory theory that every new event changes your whole set of memories. So my, my experience is that memory is something um, plastical, something that changes all the time. <laughs> there's, no fixed, there's no fixed set. So to, uh, to compare memory to, to, to a set of photographs is, in my, in my opinion, completely wrong. It's, it's, it's something that lives and it's, it's changing all the way. And um, in their form, it's not technical, or it's not technical in the terms of you have a camera in your head. Right. Yeah. I, just to follow up briefly, though. I yeah, mean, no, like yeah. In, in your in your depiction of how yeah. your memory came back or yeah. works, uh, you said reset as in a reset button. You sure. Yeah. Sure. Network. We, and, and so I, that's yeah. what's really fascinating to me is the idea that we try to speak within. The sort Technical of terms, yeah. The ter right, and so network or yeah. d even distributed network works a lot better for thinking of how our minds work. Yes, sure. Because maybe because also photography is not the predominant media that it once Anymore, was. Anymore, sure, yeah. Now you would say your brain is like a hard disk and not not right. not a set of photographs. Mm -hmm. Sure, and every like every generation does it, yeah. <laughs> compares it just to the newest newest technology. And you, you will find there's a, a dozen of these pictures I showed in the beginning, like the, the human body as a factory or as a, a, a you know a telephone um, system or whatever. Yeah, but this is it doesn't really you know that's why I, I like those movies because they they have to depict this kind of utopian fantasy. They have to find pictures for it. They have to to tell the story. They have to find an equivalent. And the weird thing, I mean, this, this um, final cut where he opens the, the, the memory of this person, sure, these guys from Sweden saw it, and they just they reproduced it. And they say, OK, that's, how, that's your memory. Now it's in the, in the little box. <laughs> but um, I, actually, I didn't. I, I just wanted to open a new ground for, for whatever discussion comes up tomorrow. And I just wanted to, to claim. Uh, this this field of you know uh, meaning within the field of photo photography there's much more to it and um, I hope I I, yeah. I did I, I did it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.